as someone who never thought he'd raise a baby and then suddenly in the middle of his life was living with one, uh, I found it uh, as inspiring as it was fascinating. Uh, Dr. Golden, welcome to SiriusXM Insight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, and thank you for writing this book. I got to tell you, I I thought I had been so immersed in baby culture, and you really made me examine all of us in a whole new way. I want to dive right into it. What do you mean when you say babies made us modern? Well, uh, although historians have, I think, not paid enough attention to babies, they were the way that millions and millions of ordinary American families really entered our modern world. If you stop and think about it, um, babies um, joined Americans to kind of scientific medicine, the idea of fighting germs, keeping the nursery clean, not letting the milk sit out all day and get sour. Uh, they joined us to consumer Sure, and I'm going to guess here, I don't know you, but I'm sure you bought quite a bit for your baby. <laughs> yes. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but they really taught people who lived on farms and out in the countryside to maybe get that Sears catalog and not buy for themselves, but buy for their baby. Or maybe the first thing they paid cash for in town was baby formula. So they really joined us to consumer culture. And, of course, department stores went all out to get uh future moms in there and created infants departments and even put nurses and advisors in them. Um, babies really connect us to the government. Uh, the United States created the first uh, federal agency in the entire world dedicated to children, the U.S. Children's Bureau, and babies were a key part of that, keeping them alive. And so they produced what we call Uncle Sam's bestseller, a little booklet called Infant Care. Mm -hmm. They went out to millions and millions and millions of Americans who had tremendous faith that Uncle Sam could tell them how to raise their babies uh, in a positive way, not like today. Yeah. And then, of course, all our ideas about psychology, you know, people didn't start talking about egos and development because they, they read Freud or went to class. It's because all those baby advice books kind of taught them about psychology. Absolutely. So there you have it in a nutshell. Um, I, I know the uh, U.S. Children's Bureau was established in 1912, and it's one thing to like think about, what is this government trying to raise our babies for? As it was nothing of the kind. It was the U.S. government actually trying to support the citizens and taxpayers of the nation. And i, I got to admit, I think a lot about the baby economy, um, but I didn't really think that deeply about things like how the economy really, really changed dramatically through people purchasing products like clothing for babies and formula instead of just making that themselves, which had been the case in the 19th century. That's right. And it's, uh, you know, if you probably looked at what was in your nursery and you'd think, well, that's just what people did. But no, we had to teach them. The government actually gave them patterns so they could sew their own baby clothes. Uh, of course, there was a lot of marketing to be done. Formula companies were out there selling things, uh, formula, Cairo syrup to mix in the formula you made at home, um, baby strollers, uh, baby bonnets, all baby shoes, baby pictures, that Kodak brownie camera that uh, we used to use before we went digital. Mm -hmm. uh, that was really sold. Is, look, you don't have to go downtown and go to the the formal photography studio. You can take your own baby pictures. So if you had a camera in your house at one point, the old-fashioned it's probably because that derived from the idea of taking pictures of your infant. <laughs> it's true. My God, I had to make a whole Facebook profile just for baby pictures because I'm insufferable. I never thought I'd be that annoying uh, dad guy. But I also found it interesting how they influence the economy, not just in terms of purchasing products. I had never really thought about how babies really, in many cases, began connecting uh, families, for better or worse, to banks because institutions began offering things like savings accounts and bonds upon birth. That's right. First, the bank, banks are very clever. The first thing they I'll did say. was to go after the kids, <laughs> right? So they had those little savings banks, and you'd put your coins in, and then you'd take them down to the bank, and you'd make your deposit. Well, after they got to the kids, and because they had programs in the schools, they went after the babies. So they started producing baby books. Mm. And some of them had little perforated deposit slips. Some of them had places where you recorded all the 
cash gifts you got when you had a new baby. Some of them were actually coin banks with a little bit of places to keep records of baby in them. And the banks went after them. And, of course, the insurance companies did, too. The Metropolitan Life Insurance handed out so many baby books, so many infant advice books. My favorite ones being about how to help your baby get a good tan Mm. because we're so afraid of rickets and had our babies out tanning all the time when that was the, the good science. So, yes, all sorts of people went after babies and got them to kind of be our way into opening savings accounts. Um, early in the book, you talk about something that I admit I had never heard before in, in this context, and I don't think many people have heard of it in the 21st century, um, and that's incubator shows. What were right. inc- what were incubator shows, and, and how did these things make it from the fairground to the hospital ward? Very slowly is the answer. Incubator shows started in Europe at the end of the 19th century, where literally at a at a county fair at, at the equivalent of a world's fair you would have these little glass and metal incubators that kept premature babies warm and people would pay money to go inside and look at the babies in the incubators uh, they weren't going to be hospital technologies because they were they were expensive they required a lot of good nursing care um, to clean them to feed the babies which often had to be fed by dropper So you weren't going to be able to afford to put them in the hospitals right away. Uh, But when people paid a quarter to go inside and look at the babies, then you could have the the cash flow you needed to run the incubators. And, of course, if you'd grown up on a farm, which millions of people had, they knew about incubators for kind of hatching the chicks. But this was kind of the post-hatch infants. Mm -hmm. And and people loved them. And there was a lot of great press about them and about these premature infants who were saved And uh, they slowly made their way into hospitals because hospitals would have fundraisers um, and maybe buy one or two. Or because when the the World's Fair left town, they would leave the incubators with the local hospital. But it really took several decades before they became hospital technologies. And I think I mentioned in my book, if you remember the old TV show, Boardwalk Empire. Sure. There are always scenes there where... um, Nucky Thompson is walking down the boardwalk in Atlantic City and looking at the babies in the incubator show. And in fact, there was an incubator show on the Atlantic City boardwalk. And there was the most famous one on the Coney Island boardwalk in New York that then uh, moved to the New York World's Fair in 1939, 1940. I remember that. It was bizarre. I I, I had never heard of such a thing. And it it seems like it wasn't so much to look at the babies. I mean, people people really lined the streets and would pay to just look at babies in these glass or or metal boxes. And, And it seems that it was all about just the struggle against death through technology. Right. right. Although I think my fav- one of my favorite anecdotes that I tell in the book is, I guess people were used to going to what we would have called back then freak shows at, at yeah. fairs. Mm-hmm. So well, there was one young man who went into the baby show, very disappointed, and came out and was warning the crowd, they don't do anything, they just sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you had to be kind of enchanted by babies or premature babies to enjoy it. But I also read that sometimes women would pick out a favorite baby and come back day after day to see how they were doing. Right. So there was an emotional connection as well as kind of, gosh, do we have the the science, the technology to intervene in what was then and is today kind of the greatest killer of infants, which is prematurity. So it's a it's a story about something that's still with us that we still have to confront, which is infant mortality due to premature birth. Yeah, and I was kind of I was kind of shocked. I mean, it's another commentary on on capitalism that for you know up until the, the 1930s, I mean, they they weren't really used seriously in hospitals because hospitals couldn't afford the incubators, but the the freak shows could ticket sales could pay for it, but hospitals didn't have the funds. Hospitals shouldn't have the funds for the nurses to take care of the incubators. They could mm. probably have bought an incubator. They were they were pretty simple devices. Uh, but you've got to keep them clean. And then with a premature infant, you have to feed it with a tube or by a dropper. So it's intense nursing care. And um, as you see in a premature nursery today, where it's almost one nurse to every one or two babies. So they just didn't have the funds to have these incubators there for them. And, um, of course, a lot of people didn't, in the early days, didn't live close to hospitals anyway. So they really 
um, needed to either make their own kind of home incubators, which people did, or to get to the World's Fair or the the boardwalk if it, there was one in town and, and put their babies in these incubators. Uh, but there's some wonderful pictures of them. I included some. There's some wonderful ones online. They're kind of a, a – well, they're not – and they were all over the world, but they became kind of an American boardwalk phenomenon. Um, as a parent myself, I, I got to tell you, I found it fascinating how parenting has changed over the years and how you document that in the book. What were some of the more surprising or, or curious child-rearing trends you came across in your research? Uh, well, uh, some of my favorites, because they really do reflect our historic scientific thinking were ideas like, don't kiss your baby. And they used to make these wonderful bibs that said, don't kiss me on them. Because, of course, we're afraid of conveying germs. I don't think we do that anymore. At least I hope not. Uh, Let your baby cry. It's good for their lungs. That seems maybe counterintuitive today. But for people who've grown up in a world where tuberculosis took so many lives, it was the major killer of the 19th century, the idea that you could let your baby strengthen her lungs by crying just made good sense. And of course, one of my favorites is get your baby out there and have baby get a healthy tan. Um, so they, uh, there were all sorts of devices for, you know, you know, sun lamps, they're famous. I don't want to confuse them with our contemporary problem, what we call baby cages right. that fit outside your, your, um, window if you lived in a in an apartment building so your baby would be out in the sunshine there and yeah all sorts of interesting uh, advice although i will say uh, a lot of things are still with us people worried about their parent their babies uh they wanted to know what the future held for their babies they wanted their children to grow up and be educated. So a lot of similarities as well as differences. Yeah, I, w- I thought it was interesting seeing how anxiety drives so many parenting trends and so much of the baby economy. Uh, it was interesting reading your book how, how parents used to note every single little accident that most babies have, a scraped knee, falling down, and how early on they were all noted in baby books. And then that just kind of stopped because parents began to be judged more on their children's apparent safety. Yeah, that's right. I, I When I first started reading baby books, and, and that's really the, the my research, people would say, oh, baby fell out of the high chair and cried, or baby, you know, did this, had some kind of accident, but didn't cry or didn't hurt herself. And they would record all those accidents because they saw it as a normal part of babyhood. Mm. And then after World War II, they just almost completely disappeared. And I think, you know, I've raised kids, uh, you, you've raised kids, you know that babies still have little accidents and bang things and fall over. Uh, but people are very afraid of, I guess, being accused of being a bad parent, so they stopped writing it down. <laughs> and as I noted also, we don't write down the times we spanked or hit our children anymore. Oh, what a I tragedy, yeah. That has gone away, but... People who used to, you know, had a place in the baby books that you'd buy to fill in and keep a record. It would say baby's first discipline, and moms would diligently fill in, fill in, oh, I had to spank baby for doing this. Oh, that's love in action, yeah. Um, but it seems like the <laughs> pendulum swung again because after they stopped noting it all, then later uh, people began taking their children to doctors for even the most minor injuries. It seems like the cultural trend reflected, I guess, the anxieties that every parent goes through. Am I overparenting? Am I underparenting? Back and forth. Well, yes, and I did see that in letters to the Children's Bureau, to Uncle Sam. The women who ran the U.S. Children's Bureau got over 200,000 letters a year in their early years, and they'd answer all of them. And a lot of them would be, well, I went to the doctor for this, and then I went to another doctor, and now I need to know what the government thinks about what I should be doing about my infant's constipation. And then... We get another generation later on, kind of the Spock generation, and the, uh, many fewer letters to the Children's Bureau, but a number of them are from uh, the mothers-in-law who say, my daughter-in-law is not following the government way to raise my grandchild. What should I do? Uh, so, uh, yes, people were anxious, but they saw the government was kind of the final arbiter on how to raise babies. 
My guest is Dr. Janet Golden. She's the author of Babies Made Us Modern, How Infants Brought America into the 20th Century. And our number here at Sirius XM Insight is 877-974-7487. That's 877-9-SERIOUS. Doctor, what motivated you to write this book? Uh, I'm going to give full credit to a friend of mine who suggested we nobody's written a book about the history of babies. Why don't we write one and it'll just be a lot of fun. And then uh, she was a dean at her university and she was too busy to work on it with me. So I kept going and it's, I started off with the fun stuff, the baby parades, you know, where you dress up the carriages and stroll with them. Um, but I did find once I started reading baby books and letters to the children's bureau and, uh, the records of uh, infants and children interned in Japanese American camps and about racial disparities. And it was really a serious topic, uh, as well as one that sort of went in all sorts of directions from the investigation of, you know, advertisements for babies or babies working as salespeople, we might say yeah. sales babies. Um, it, it just went in so many directions. So it wasn't, it's not an entirely happy book. Um, But I think it tells a big picture about American history. Absolutely. I mean, you dedicate a couple of chapters in the book on babies and money, and not just their cost, but, of course, on their role in the marketplace and the entire economy. I don't think a lot of people would realize how much impact they've had. Yes, they have. They are, you know, they're very cute, and so they're very good at doing things, and I think two of the the products I found most interesting is they used to te- sell uh, Iver Johnson revolvers mm-hmm. uh, with lots, lots of cute baby pictures because it would say accidental discharge impossible. I don't read gun advertisements, but I imagine we don't have babies in them anymore. <laughs> and uh, uh, and then they also, uh, well, they sold cigars. The Castle Hall Cigar Twins were selling cigars and cigarettes and uh, Pepsi and all sorts of things we don't really associate with uh, infants anymore. Although I do have that one anecdote about the baby who smoked his first cigarette at age seven months, which was in a baby book. And then he wrote as an adult, I am still smoking. Uh, so there's a habit that I'm glad didn't go too far. It is amazing because babies, you know, are a financial investment. Um, and, and I think it was CNN a couple of years ago did an estimate that to raise uh, a pet, a dog to age uh 15 would cost you about $13,000 to raise a child to age uh, 18 is almost a quarter million dollars on the average in America right now. I mean, they're a steep investment and they force families to spend money. But yeah, babies are product promoters. They encourage government investment. Babies affect legislation. Um, But it was also interesting to read about how much people paid to have someone take their babies and how much people paid to take others' babies. That's right. I mean, one of the things that I had to confront in this book and in some of my other writing is that our sad history worldwide of infant abandonment. Um, It was particularly profound in the late 19th, early 20th century where babies would be left on the streets. Uh, Today, I know there are fire stations that say, leave your baby, no questions asked. And um, then there would be instances where women had to go out and work and they might pay somebody to take in their baby, what was called a baby farmer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Some of them were really providing care and some of them you sort of understood. You made one payment, you left the baby, you tried to feel pretty good about that, uh, but when you couldn't pay any more, you knew that that infant was going to be dead very soon and buried in the backyard or sent to the almshouse uh, where it would be mistreated and, and would die. And the mortality rates in those institutions was close to 100%. You just, as somebody put it very, I think it was Jacob Reese said, you just can't raise babies wholesale. Um, so we had a, we had a, had and have had a very sad history for unwanted infants and children. And I had to confront that in the book and think about the economics of that as well. Yeah, I'll say. I mean, it really, it's incredible to think about how the whole modern era, as we know it, was propelled partially by a desire to keep babies alive, to keep them disease-free, to keep them well-fed, and to keep them happy. And it seems like the desire to keep babies happy is a uniquely 20th century phenomenon. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I'd agree with that, I, because, Please. you know, dig up toys and 
in uh, when we do archaeological digs and things like that. So I think people did try and keep their babies um, happy. Well, I, I mean, I guess on, 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 an, uh, on a level that affected uh, a national economy. But yes, on the national economy, we certainly did invest in our babies. And uh, uh, what, one of the things I found interesting about that was um, all the uh, radio shows dedicated to giving infant care advice or to selling infant care products. Mm-hmm. Um, so babies, you know, I, I found it interesting during World War II. On the one hand, we have babies out there selling war bonds, and I think they did a pretty good job of that. <laughs> if you're a series E bond, that, that was a very cute baby there. And uh, on the other hand, uh, we have a lot of uh, radio shows telling us what to buy for babies. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Heinz Company had one go- going, and they kept it going even though people were in kind of straightened circumstances with rationing during the war and before that in the Depression, because they knew the war would end, and then you'd go out and buy more of their baby food. And, of course, that's another industry we really got going here in this country uh, to the point where um, Gerber started off as just kind of a, a, a meat and vegetable packing industry and it very quickly said, babies are our business, our only business, because mm. that's where the money was. Mm-hmm. Is it true that that uh, that the Gerber baby really was Humphrey Bogart? Did you discover that in your research? I always heard that. I always heard that too, but I couldn't verify that. Mm, okay, I One... think it's I think it's an internet rumor, and I I didn't pursue it. Um, well, let's talk about you know product advertisement with babies then, because we do know how influential advertisements and and ads with babies can be, but. As you point out in your book, there's a really a, a darker or at least a more political side to their role in promotion. And in one of the later chapters in the book, you, you discuss the use of babies in wartime propaganda. Um, can we go deeper on that? How did this come about and what was the impact of the messaging? Well, uh, you know, babies have long had a, a role in political and wartime propaganda and probably uh, the most effective use was overseas during World War One, when there were all these pictures of supposedly uh, German soldiers bayoneting Belgian babies. Mm. You can imagine the, the response to that. Um, but in the United States, we tended to use them simply to sell war bonds. Yeah. Um, but w- I think there was always the threat of that. Then we get to the Cold War era, and uh, very interesting things come about with that. One is we have to start thinking about fallout shelters. And if your listeners are old enough, they'll know what that is. Mm-hmm. That's where we were supposed to go and hide after those nuclear explosions. So then the question is, Dr. Spock is getting letters. Well, what kind of food do I take in the fallout shelter for my baby? That was one thing. And then when we had above-ground nuclear weapons tests, uh, the byproducts of that, the strontium-90, would get into the air, it would get into the clouds, it would rain, get into the soil, the cows would eat the grass uh, and give milk with the strontium-90, and it would be picked up in infant's baby teeth. And so we have a whole collection, I think about 70,000 infant teeth, uh, where they were studying the radioactive fallout that babies got, and that's all in, a, I think, at the Washington University in St. Louis. So uh, babies were a part of that Cold War anxiety as well. What was that radiation going to do to them? What would it be like to live in a fallout shelter with an infant? How are we going to deliver babies if the moms are in fallout shelters? People really do think about their infants in wartime and not simply to buy war bonds, but what will the consequences be? And, of course, we we did create some daycare centers for those those parents who uh, went to work on the assembly lines and the victory lines in World War II, we had to take care of their babies while they're at work. I mean, it, yeah, that's one thing that the book keeps coming back to. I mean, just as, as the uh, natural parental instinct to protect one's baby is one of the most noble things about the species, it's also one of the most easily manipulated. Yes, very true. Um, babies can be... Um, uh, how we treat them is a reflection of what we can can do and can know as a society, um, and we can make good and bad choices. I, I know that we're in a particularly fraught political time with that now. I don't know if we want to go there or not. Let's but, go there a uh, little bit, yeah, because um, but, I'd like to if you can, yeah. Um, yeah. 
I mean, we, we've had a lot of guests on the show who've spoken extensively about the foster care system and adoption, which obviously is uh, very political right now um, with what's going on at the border. You do touch on different aspects of this that we haven't yet discussed. And, and for those who haven't yet read your book, how has adoption or, or the foster care system changed over the years? Oh, adoption has a fascinating history. I'm so glad you asked. It used to be that as the sort of the discipline of psychology got going, and even before that, people wanted to adopt older children. They wanted to sometimes put them to work, like when they were on the orphan trains coming out of New York. Um, or the, And those were New York City orphans who were sent west and kind of distributed to farming families. And some of them were, were given pretty harsh lives, almost as farm workers. Um, but we also had families that begin to want to adopt, and then they, they're told, oh, get the older child. So, you know, with the... They're kind of their makeup, their intellect is all about. But families uh, start turning towards wanting babies. And if there are not enough babies for them to adopt, they turn to the baby black market. And uh, I was fortunate or unfortunate, I guess you could say, to have to read all of the Kefauver hearings about that from the 1950s to find out what people were paying to buy babies, how that black market in babies operated. And I think one of the most fascinating things I found is there was a, a New York City uh, mob activity. Then their primary business was uh, selling babies to families that wanted them. And their secondary business was in gambling. So I think that tells us something. <laughs> um, you know, you note that one of the greatest challenges in writing your book was one that a lot of historians confront, how to draw useful conclusions about literally millions of subjects. How did you go about the research for this book? I had a wonderful time researching this book, and I'm going to give a shout out to my my good friends at the UCLA Biomedical Library because the archivist there, Dr. Uh, Russell Johnson, said at one point, "Gee, I should collect all these baby books that are sitting in drawers and attics and whatever because they're full of medical information, but of course they're full of so much more." So he gets online every day, and he has a little uh, endowment there, and he buys used baby books on eBay, and he has about 2,000 of them now. Mm. And reading through them was just fascinating because the ones he buys are the, we'll call them the less expensive ones kept by ordinary families, given by commercial marketers or banks or insurance companies, Um, and uh, there, so that you get to see the advertisements, you get to see the entries, you get a real sense of where Americans were going with that over time. And then I got to take a look at all the uh, uh, baby book advertising and some of the uh, collections at the Duke Advertising Archives and the information there. And that was kind of fascinating, too, because uh, they knew them. I don't know about you, but they knew the moms were tasting the uh, baby food before they get to the babies. So they had to make something that the babies liked, but also that the moms liked. And uh, that was kind of fun to read about, too. Uh, The entire book is fun, and it's as informative as it is enjoyable. Uh, Dr. Janet Golden is the author. The book is Babies Made Us Modern, How Infants Brought America into the 20th Century. I learned a lot. It was a lovely read. Thank you so very much for joining us today on SiriusXM. Thank you. Thank you for having me.